Hi, my name is Maureen Sprague. I am a diabetes educator and a registered dietitian, and I am here to talk to you just about the most frequent questions that I get around food uh, with regard to diabetes, and I'm doing this for National Nutrition Month. So the most frequent questions that I get usually are, how much carb should I eat, if any, at the meal? Um, should I eat, should I do the keto diet? And should I try intermittent fasting? I'll also touch a little bit on the Mediterranean diet as this is uh, comes up, but also the research is really showing a lot of good benefits to the Mediterranean diet. It can be really helpful to first understand what the definition of, of is of a low carb diet and a very low carb diet. These terms are thrown around quite a bit and it can get very confusing. The definition of a low carb diet is less than 150 grams of carbohydrate a day. And that's in general, you'll find varying definitions depending on what resource you're looking at. But in general, 150 grams a day is considered low carb. Research does show that eating a low carb diet can be very beneficial if you have type 2 diabetes. It helps lower your hemoglobin A1C, it helps with weight loss, it can help lowering triglycerides, and it can help with reducing inflammation. And reducing inflammation is really important for anyone with a chronic uh, disease as it can play a, a big role in multiple disease states, including diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we often think of things like arthritis, but it plays a role in, in many disease states. There really hasn't been a lot of research done with type 1 diabetes, but we do know that People with type 1, if they eat less carb, their medication needs are less, insulin needs are less, and there can be some benefit to that as well. So the definition of a very low carb diet, which is what a keto diet is, is that it's 50 grams or less of carbohydrates per day. And the goal of keto is to get your body to shift from using carbohydrate as its main energy source, which is what it wants to do, uh, get it to shift into using fat as an energy source. And a byproduct of breaking fat down is ketones. And then ketones can be used by muscles and various um, organs in the body as a source of energy. The keto diet has shown some benefit for blood sugar control and weight management. The challenges with the keto diet and something that restrictive is that it's very hard to maintain. People often get burned out uh, after a short period of time. And often what I see happening is people will then go back to eating the way they were and the weight comes back on and even more weight comes on than where you started when, you, uh, when people go on the keto diet. The other issue that I see with the keto diet is often the types of fats that you should eat is not discussed. And that's really important for cardiovascular health as well as just good nutrition in general. If the keto diet's not done well, it can cause nutrient deficiencies, uh, low blood pressure, and that's because we lose electrolytes and we, use, we lose uh, water when we shift to a, a keto diet. Constipation can happen because in general, it can be low fiber and sometimes depression can happen. There is some research that shows uh, people on very low carb diets um, have less serotonin production and that's because serotonin it's one of its building blocks is carbohydrate. So it's good to be aware of that and to watch for any signs of that should you decide to use keto as part of your uh, diabetes managing or managing your diabetes. If you are on medications for diabetes, it is really important that you work with your healthcare provider, pharmacist, dietitian, diabetes educator to make sure that medications are adjusted or otherwise you could have a, a low blood sugar when you shift to a very low carbohydrate diet. And also blood pressure can shift as well. So these medications need to be adjusted so that you don't have some of those um, I would say side effects or complications of a very low carb diet. So what I think is a more moderate approach that more people are able to follow is to keep carbs around 30 grams per meal and around 15 grams for snacks if you have snacks. This is considered a low carbohydrate diet. It puts us between about 100 and 125 carbs per day. 
And just as a reminder, um, and I should back up, we you don't have to have a snack in the day, but for some people, if they're going too long without eating, a snack can be helpful to help prevent you overeating at the next meal. So that just varies per person whether snacks are helpful or not. So just as a review, hopefully maybe this is a review for a lot of you, um, that we find carbohydrates in grains, in beans like black beans, kidney beans, garbanzo beans, starchy vegetables such as potatoes, peas, corn, winter squash such as pumpkin and um, acorn squash. We also find carbohydrates in fruits, in milk, in yogurt and sweets. Yogurt, there's um, a lot of Greek yogurt out there now, which is much lower carbohydrate than your traditional yogurt. So there's lots of good options there. The nut milks, um, the carbohydrate content varies dramatically. So you really need to look at the food label for that. Um, there are some carbohydrates in our non-starchy vegetables, you know, our gr leafy greens, our broccoli, cauliflower, uh, radishes, you name it. I usually like to consider these foods free because there's very little carbohydrate in there and they are so good for us. So we tend not to get enough of these foods and so I hate to restrict them for any reason and counting them as part of your carbs can cause you to restrict and I do not want that. So veggies in general I consider free. What's important to keep in mind is that we want to balance our carb-rich foods with our veggies, with our lean proteins and healthy fats so that we can both feel full and also get all the nutrients we need for our body to run well and for us to stay as healthy as possible. What we don't want to lose sight of is the types of carbohydrates we're choosing because that's really important. And yes, serving size is important because we can eat too much of a good food and cause you know blood sugars to go high. However, it is important to know or that some foods are going to affect our blood sugar more than others within this group of carbohydrates. So high fiber, less processed carbs are where we want to focus. So this includes foods such as whole grains like brown rice, rolled oats, quinoa, sweet potatoes, beans like the black beans, the kidney beans, the legumes, uh, berries. These are all some of our best choices for carbohydrates. The reason they're good choices is one, they take longer to digest. And if we slow down how fast carbohydrate leaves our stomach, then we're able to slow the rise of blood sugar. So that can be really helpful for managing your diabetes. And also that fiber is very helpful for keeping your gut bacteria healthy. If we can keep a healthy gut, it helps with our immune system, it helps with depression, it helps with weight loss. So fiber is what your healthy bacteria feed on and we want to keep a healthy environment for them. And also fiber helps you feel full and if we can feel full then hopefully we are eating less at a meal unless we're blowing right through our fullness signals and I'll touch on that a little bit later. We do want to avoid those highly processed carbs like chips and crackers, instant anything is usually too highly processed, sweets, pastries, etc. These types of carbohydrates, your body does not have to work hard at all to break them down. So they enter the bloodstream really quickly. You get a big rush of insulin and that high insulin levels can actually increase fat, um, fat storage as well or we're going to need more medication to deal with these with these types of foods and they make they make uh, blood sugar control very very challenging so the mediterranean diet has been around for a very long time it has stood the test of time as far as far as being a healthy diet it benefits many disease conditions including diabetes and heart disease it does emphasize plant-based foods. So these are a lot of the foods I was just talking about, the vegetables, the beans, the nuts and seeds, fruits, and whole intact grains. So again, this means less processed grains. So it's the difference between a thick cut oat and the instant oats, uh, is a good, or the instant potatoes versus a potato out of the ground. It also really emphasizes fish and other seafood, olive oil, olives, some dairy usually recommends lower fat dairy and eggs. Research also shows the Mediterranean diet is very helpful 
for lowering uh, blood sugars, lowering triglycerides, and reducing your risk for heart attacks and strokes. So uh, you can't really go wrong with a Mediterranean diet. I mean, if we're eating too much of anything, that's a problem. But in general, if you need a good guide, the Mediterranean diet is a good choice. So here's a plate model that I found online that kind of mimics the Mediterranean diet. And it's from the Harvard School of Public Health. I, and you can see lots of plate methods that are available online, but this one's really good because it shows a good balance between all the different foods that we've talked about. So ideally around half our plate to be vegetables, a little bit of fruit there's okay, quarter of our plate whole grains, a quarter of our plate healthy proteins, and then we want some healthy oils and fats as well. So if you're not into counting carbs, which a lot of people aren't, aren't into the numbers, a plate model is a great way to go to give you some good guidelines for the types of foods to choose. However, if you're a numbers person and you do want to get into tracking your carbs or any of your nutrients, here's some apps that I found to be useful and helpful and have some good, um, uh, they have some good features for being free. So Carb Manager, it tends to be keto focused, but it, it actually has a little more flexibility than that. Carbs and Cows is great because it uses pictures to estimate portion size. Just a, a word of warning, if you do want to use MyFitnessPal, you actually have to upgrade to get uh, to the feature of being able to count your carbs with that. So intermittent fasting, I get this question quite a bit, and there's lots of different ways to do intermittent, fa intermittent fasting. Most of the time people are talking about the time-restricted eating, but there's also the 5-2 uh, eating pattern where you're eating five days a week, and then there's a severe restriction of calories for two days a week. Then there's the 24-hour fasting method where you do no food for 24 hours for one to three days a week and then you eat normal the other days of the week. I don't recommend that for anybody with diabetes because it's really hard not to have low blood sugars and other problems with that. So I don't recommend the, the straight out 24 hour no eating. The time restricted is just how it sounds is where we restrict our eating to a window of time in the day. And the shortest window is I've seen is four hours. The biggest window is eight hours. And so you're fasting for those times outside of that window. Research does show that people with type two diabetes can benefit. Uh, it's, it's these diets, intermittent fasting has been shown to lower blood glucose and to lower weight. There's not been any research done with type one diabetes. Um, these types of restricted eating do limit your calorie intake in general. So whether that's what's causing the lower glucose and the lower weight, it's hard to tell. But we do know that the, it's good for the gut to fast for a period of time. So I think we'll see a lot more research coming out about this and we're gonna learn a lot more about it. If you want to do intermittent fasting, it's important that you know the, the complications of intermittent fasting and then how to do it safely. So low blood sugar is the biggest complication, especially if you're on medications. Um, also high blood sugars can happen as people may rebound eat on those days that they haven't restricted calories and dehydration can happen with restricted fluid intake. So if you are going to do intermittent fasting, you want to talk about this with your doctor, your diabetes educator, your pharmacist to help come up with a plan to prevent these complications from happening. Ideally, good blood glucose sugars, uh, or, or I'm sorry, blood glucose control is good to have before you start. Uh, I know that's not real world all the time, but keep that in mind. Ideally, we want things fairly stable before you start something like this. But at a minimum, you want to be testing your blood sugar frequently or wearing a continuous glucose monitor so you can see the effect of the fasting on your blood sugars and then make adjustments accordingly. And as I mentioned, most likely you will need to make adjustments to your medications uh, to help prevent those low blood sugars or high blood sugars. So the take home messages, even though I emphasized a couple of different eating patterns, we know there's really no one size fits all. And it's really helpful if you can work with 
a dietitian to come up with a plan that's going to work for you that you can do for a lifetime because going on and off diets has never worked. It's, it's hard on the system. We see a lot of uh, weight gain come from the weight or from the diet cycling. So we want it something that you can do for a lifetime. We do know that lower carbohydrate diets help to reduce blood sugar, helps to reduce medication needs, and can help reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease or heart attacks and strokes. The Mediterranean diet is an excellent approach and a, and a great guide for healthy eating, and there's lots of resources online that you can find for the Mediterranean diet. And probably a really good approach is a lower carb Mediterranean diet, and my guess is um, that's out there. So the quality of your food choices does really matter. We don't want to get lost in the weeds with looking at numbers only. And I see this happen in that we're looking at only calories or only grams of carbohydrate versus what it, types of food I'm eating for good health. So that's just as important as the number. And I want to end with um, the importance of actually looking at whether there's any emotional or stress eating going on because that's going to override any meal plan that you're following and it's really important to identify it and find up i'm sorry and, and come up with strategies to avoid it and there's some great resources i really like eatingmindfully.com dr susan albers she's got some great resources to help with preventing this emotional stress eating Okay, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I wish you a happy and healthy uh, Diabetes Month.